everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Dr. Brad Sachs, and we're going to be talking about his book, Emptying the Nest. So welcome, Dr. Sachs. Or do you Thanks. prefer me to call you Brad? What do you prefer? Uh, either one. Whatever you're most comfortable with is fine with me. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I, I was telling you earlier that there are a couple of primers, I think, for how to raise a high school and college kid. And now this has gone on my bookshelf as one of the <laughs> key books to read. Seriously, because I think... I'll, um, there are not a lot of good books. There's a lot of books like when, when the kids are like zero to five and then there's a dearth and then there's this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what, and I think the reason why is what you talk about in the book that kids go through various phases. And so our parenting goes through various phases. So can you, um, describe like, you know, when, when does this, this part of parenting kick in and how would you describe that phase in parenthood? Well, there's two ways to answer the question. Uh, the more elemental or fundamental way is separation or the process of separation begins at birth. From the moment that we are born, the separation process begins. Mm -hmm. So lots of times parents will ask me, well, when should I begin preparing my son or daughter for autonomy? They're preparing for autonomy the moment that they arrive on this earth. But when we talk about young adulthood, we're usually thinking about the end of high school through college into the early mid-20s. Mm -hmm. So maybe saying the ages between 18 and 28 would be that developmental wheelhouse that we're looking at when we talk about this particular stage. Okay. Um, a part of me um, shrieked in terror. You couldn't see it in my face. But when you said 28, it was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, <Until> 28. <laughs> <laughs> What's that right. all about? I did not see the terror, but I can certainly <laughs> understand the legitimacy of it. Um, look, when I say 28, I'm not suggesting that 28-year-olds um, are always going to be living in their parents' basements and depending on them for food and housing. What I'm saying is the conveyor belt towards independence and self-sufficiency in our culture at this point is much longer than it was in previous generations. Oh my and gosh. it takes a longer time to achieve that kind of autonomy and self-reliance. Wow, that's fascinating. So, because I was thinking at 28, I was already launched into my career, living on my own, but I guess this generation yeah. is different. Uh, it is different, and it's easy to sort of demonize or scapegoat either the parents for having been too protective or the young adults for being slackers. But you really can't separate individual or family behavior from the larger sociocultural narratives. And the fact is, uh, socioeconomically, it just takes a longer time to achieve that kind of independence. Yeah. When I was in high school, um, many of my classmates uh, did not go to college, got jobs in industry. And by the time they were in their mid twenties, they already had a salary, a decent pension, and they were able to afford housing, cars, college for their kids uh, in an industrial job and salary. The likelihood of anyone with just a high school degree being able to achieve that these days is basically eliminated. So there are economic and socioeconomic challenges that lengthen this conveyor belt and make the process of becoming autonomous a little more elastic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an oversimplification to assume that it's because young adults aren't motivated or millennials don't care or parents are coddling or indulging. Okay, so I um, just dropped my eldest to uh, college in August, and they had a session at um, eight in the morning about, you know, parenting um, kids that are going off to college. And the, the uh, school administrator started off by saying, we know by the fact that you're here at eight in the morning that all of you need to let go. <laughs> and then they went in to describe helicoptering, <laughs> Snow plowing, all these terms that I had heard of helicoptering, but there's snow plowing and there's one mm. other one that they were describing all the different flavors of parents of nowadays <laughs> that this this highly selective school and the kid and their parents. This is kind of like um so I get it was a very interesting it was kind of an off putting um <laughs> this is kind of like yeah. yeah, good morning, go away. 
leave yeah, us right. alone was kind of the tone. I'd much prefer how you <laughs> stated in your book, because you talk about in your book, you talk about different, um, you know, different things that the child should be doing at that at that juncture. And um, I thought it would be great if we could just start off there. You talk about pulling anchor and setting sail and you talk about, you know, the kids having to individuate and uh, that they're regrouping, they're progressing. They're, oh, no, these are different types of uh, students, the rights of wrong, rights and wrongs of passage in, in chapter one. So uh, you talk about what your kids are going through. And so you start off talking about grief, you have grieving, uh, composing a declaration of independence, identify without being identical, developing a personal philosophy, overcoming the fear of leaving home, creating a temporary toxic home environment, asking questions of oneself than others, loosening the border patrol. So there's a whole bunch of things that I, I didn't know. I mean, I could have logically figured it out if I took the time, which I did. But even some of the stuff that I read about, you just still don't know what your children are going through. So right. help us understand, like, maybe, you know, there's this is a whole chapter with like 10 sections in it. But what are the things that you think are the most important things for parents to know as their kids launch? Like what's happening to them developmentally during this 18 to 28 year old period? Well, I think I'll start with what you mentioned first, which is the grieving process, because I always have said that adolescence doesn't just happen to the adolescent, it happens to the whole family. Mm -hmm. And I think young adulthood and separation doesn't just happen to the young adult, it happens to the whole family. And in our culture, we don't really speak the language of grief very eloquently or very eagerly. And I think we forget and neglect the fact that there's a tremendous amount of grieving associated with healthy growth. Mm -hmm. For the young adult, you cannot become an adult until you say goodbye to your childhood. You have to bury your childhood self to emerge as an adult. And the parents have some grieving to do too, and they're often not aware of that either. They're grieving for the loss of their relevance, their significance, how essential they have been, because we're never more necessary on this planet than we are when we're taking care of our young and raising them. That's what we're designed to do. So when we're being nudged to the margins of irrelevance and insignificance by our children's growth, it's tremendously painful painful for the parents as well. And usually it's some version of that unspoken grief, that unspoken longing or mourning that gets families stuck and makes it hard for them to move forward as a family, as a unit. And that's where I do find the little labels, helicopter this and snowplow that. I, I find them to be vast oversimplifications mm -hmm. of what's really happening in a family as children are moving towards separation and departure and parents are preparing for the next stage in their lives, in their marriage, uh, in their existence. Mm. So the grieving, all the types of grieving that you loss of, um, of relevance, loss of motherhood. Like for me, I, I actually start, I wrote, uh, I was just writing a ton when my son left for college and it was amazing the number of things that you lose because for women, at least at my age, um, you're losing your womanhood because you no longer can have children. You know, I, I'm actually, you know, intersection of menopause and losing that aspect of my womanhood and motherhood at the same right. time. In addition to that, like loss of relevance, loss of meaning, loss of relationship, loss of importance. There's a lot of right. loss as in addition to what you mentioned in your book of like a different type of family dynamic, right? You lose the family of four or now a family of three, you know, it's, right. there's a loss of dynamics. So there's a ton of grieving, but how does that grieving prevent good launching from happening? Well, grieving ultimately is a liberating process. When we grieve, we emancipate ourselves. We come to terms with what we are losing, what we're leaving behind in preparation for moving forward with our lives. That happens when we grieve a beloved, someone who has departed and passed and moved on. And it also takes place developmentally when we grieve for who we were or who we used to be. Mm. But when we grieve, it ultimately opens up new pathways and new possibilities for growth, development, self-realization. When we don't grieve, we kind of get stuck and lose traction. 
And that's the piece that often takes place in families that are struggling to launch their young adult. Either the young adult is not doing some of that grieving on his or her part, or the parents are not doing that grieving on their part, or the family as a whole is not engaged in some sort of meaningful conversation regarding what needs to be left behind so that they can reconstitute themselves on the new shore of the next stage of their development. Right. And that unspoken language, that sort of voiceless longing that I think shows up in every family at this stage, because it is heartbreaking. I mean, for parents to be abandoned by their children is truly heartbreaking, even though it's everything that we want for them. Mm. And no child leaves home without worrying or fearing how their family is going to do without them there. You know, children have tremendous loyalty and they handle that loyalty in many different ways. Sometimes they try to override it or ignore it. Sometimes they succumb to it and sacrifice their own future. So when we tease those dynamics, those realities to the surface, families often more naturally and spontaneously figure out a way to move forward. Mm. If not, they get stymied or they stagnate. And developmentally, that doesn't work. I get it. So actually, let me see if I can put this together. So had instead someone tell me to get lost um, at eight in the morning, <laughs> which is what happened when I went to my college, when well, my son's college, but I ended up going to the same college. But had they said, <laughs> had they said, you know what, um, you know, there's, there's a grieving process that's happening. You need to, you know, appreciate that there is a loss right here. And, and because, so if you think about helicoptering as I want to, you know, be connected and continue to have this relationship with the child, right. Which is essentially what helicoptering I think is, or snow plowing where it's like, they can't, I'm important. They can't survive without me. Those are yes. all, those are yes. all a result of improper grieving or on the flip side, it could be the child, right? Which is not necessarily letting go because they're not grieving the loss of their childhood or right. those things. So it could be both directions. Now, yes. had they said that, I'd be like, okay, good point. <laughs> That's a good point. I will well, grieve. That would be speaking. That would be speaking the language of grief. And you know, it's interesting. The phrase you mentioned that the dean deployed, which was "get lost," in a way, the dean kind of captured this theme of loss. Getting lost is the same thing as feeling a loss, in this case, a loss of direction or purpose or significance. So in a funny way, the language was there, but it doesn't sound like it was <laughs> translated particularly I know, well. it was just a little bit harsh, just kind of like, get out of my face. Um. Yes, right. <laughs> Anyhow, what are some of the other things that you see kind of get parents kind of locked up that they don't realize uh, in terms of the rites of passage that are happening for your child that are really important for parents to understand that they just, if they understood, it would be easier for them to let go. Yeah. One of them, I mentioned that the declaration of interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I said a moment ago, every child has tremendous loyalty to his or her family. The ultimate loyalty is for having been brought onto this planet by their parents in whatever way that took place, through birth, through adoption, through foster care, step parenthood. There's tremendous gratitude and indebtedness. And everybody has to figure out a way to balance their loyalties. If we're too loyal to others, we're basically sacrificing ourselves or we become martyrs. If we're loyal only to ourselves, we become uh, tremendously self-absorbed or narcissistic. So all of us have to learn to toggle back and forth between loyalty to others and loyalty to ourselves, And that's what interdependence is. Mm -hmm. The thought that we can truly become independent is preposterous. None of us are ever going to be completely independent. The nature of humanity is to be in relationship with others. But on the other hand, to feel completely dependent and not have any sense of competence or mastery doesn't leave us with any self-respect. So finding that middle ground of interdependence and balancing our loyalty to others with our loyalty to ourselves is one of the crucial uh, developmental tasks for young adults mm -hmm. to master. Mm -hmm. And many parents may not be aware of what a struggle that might be and how they might be contributing to that battle. Mm -hmm. So you have, um, you mentioned in the next chapter, this a centripetal and a centrifugal force that happens, which I think is related to this balancing piece. Yes. Um, can you introduce sure. what those ideas are just for the audience since they haven't read yeah, them sure. yet? 
you know, there's, uh, you know, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of families. And so you notice certain patterns over time. Every family is different. Every child and every parent is unique. But um, I've noticed families in which the major force field is a centripetal force field in which your loyalty needs to be expressed by you not leaving home and you not moving on. And should you dare to do so, it's as if it's a betrayal or a violation of the family code. There are other families that are imbalanced in a different way. I call them centrifugal families. The force is directed outwards. Yeah. And these yeah. are children who feel like they're being expelled or evicted or sent out without having like a full tank of gas. Mm -hmm. uh, the third category I mentioned in the book is what I call mission impossible families in which the child really is encouraged to leave, but the child has an obligation to fulfill promises or commitments to the parents that have nothing to do with the child and have more to do with the parents. Mm. So perhaps mom wishes she had gone to law school, never did. So she excitedly and enthusiastically sends her daughter off to college. But there's an expectation that you're going to college to become the lawyer that I didn't become. Mm -hmm. So we almost expect our children to become our emissaries or our ambassadors into the world rather than to live their own lives. Now, every family has some of those forces built in. I mean, that's the nature of family life, but it's when the forces get kind of skewed and imbalanced and asymmetrical in a centripetal, centrifugal, or mission impossible way. That's often when problems related to leaving home in a healthy way begin to develop. Hmm. Okay, so I, I was reading these chapters going, okay, which one am I? Um, and then not realizing <laughs> until the last part, you're like, you're a little bit of everyone. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first I thought, so we have a very close knit family. And some of the things that you mentioned about this centrifugal family where it's like, you know, centered towards the family is a lot of the things that, you know, we used to play board games all the time. We used to have a lot of family time. Weekend was family yes. time. And, okay. and so we have a very, very, we do a ton of traveling together as a family. The four of us are like the four musketeers. So that kind of thing. And I'm now, I'm now seeing... I don't know if it's a downside or a potential downside. So when I read the centrifugal, I thought, oh, my gosh, I hope we're not <laughs> like harming our kids in any way. And the harm that I could see is that we are so it's so comforting to be at home that when I look at our kids versus other kids, now the both of them are introverts. So that could actually bias everything. But their behavior is wanting to stay home. They feel most comfortable staying home. They have friends, right. but they don't want to necessarily venture out. And so I think, oh, you know, I wonder if this centrifugal thing, but we don't say to them, you have to stay home. You have to hang out and play games with us. We've let go a lot right. of those things, but they still want to, they, they're centered in family. So I don't, I don't know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing. All of these forces are good things right. in the right ratio. Right. Th that's the key. You know, there's that old phrase, we want to give our children roots and wings. Well, right. roots is the centripetal force, the force that keeps us together as a family and gives us a sense of continuity. Um, wings are the force that sends us off into the world to create our new identity, to evolve. And that constant pivoting back and forth between innovation and tradition, between continuity and evolution, that creative tension is how people and families grow. So the fact that you have these lovely rituals of connection and that the children enjoy them is a terrific thing. If that's all that was in place, that would be problematic. But in balance with these other forces and the natural urge that every child has at some point to differentiate and to become separate, that's generally why evolution and development does occur. But everyone has to evolve. And the, the rituals and traditions in family life that work when the kids were 8 and 11 or 12 and 15 aren't going to be as effective or as relevant when they're 21 and 24. And that's where the flexibility of evolution has to come into play. Yeah, okay, we've evolved in those ways. I mean, we don't ask them to play. Well, they used to ask us to play board games, and we'd play yeah. like, ritualistically board games or every meal. We'd have every meal together, like those kinds of things. But then, but then they're so comfortable that they don't want to go. They don't want to go out. And but maybe is that a developmental thing that happens? Because I noticed with my eldest son, he yes. hit seventeen and then he was gone all the time. So yes. all of our worries about him 
being right. a homebody went away. So is it a developmental thing for, for kids? Yes. There are, there are natural internal forces that prompt us to evolve and develop. You don't have to install them. You don't have to create them. You don't have to spur them. What you don't want to do is get in the way of them or stymie them. Ah, but okay. every child's motivated to become competent, masterful, separate, independent, successful. Every child has a desire to broaden his or her social network beyond the family. These are natural built-in instincts. What sometimes happens, though, is that we quash them um, because of, as we said a moment ago, unable to resolve mixed loyalties, unable to grieve for what needs to be left behind. But in that sense, parents needn't worry. Every child has that apparatus, that enterprise built in to him or herself. Yes, he's, he's, he's uh, programmed we, to fly. I don't have to worry about pushing yeah. him out of the nest. Like, okay, maybe yeah. you need to go away to California for a month just so you get used right. to being away from us. Okay. Yes. You don't have to choreograph or orchestrate these right. things. They take place naturally if we don't get in the way and if there's not any other nefarious forces, you know, that yeah. are interfering. And the centripetal is this kind of, hey, you know, you're an adult. I, I, we, we were told about scaffolding. In our school, they talk about scaffolding. And it's about, like, building scaffolding so that they can actually have a wider berth of freedom. And so we, uh, with our child, we, we actually gave him more freedom as he got older. You know, like he had a, he had a you know, he could come up with later and later curfew and all these different things. And then he fell down because he, you know, totally screwed up was caught smoking cigarettes in the bathroom or vaping in the bathroom and like then those came back the those those guardrails came back but the centripetal is a part of letting them be letting them go is that is that what the centripetal idea is or centrifugal rather yeah the centrifugal would be the force that supports and encourages and buttresses their natural desire to soar to explore to test limits to take risks to try out adventures and again some families err in that direction the parents are so eager for the child to have independent experiences it's almost as if they expel or evict the child before he or she is ready to move forward yeah. um and and that would be a problem that resides on the other side of the dynamic spectrum yeah i think there is a great example that you use in a book of a family they had like three or four kids <clears throat> this is the fourth kid and and you know they're waiting to launch this child so they could move to their retirement house yes, and the right. beach or something like that and right. it's like okay yeah you're ready to go you're ready to go and the kid's like you know he wasn't I'm, quite ready i'm not ready to go because you're trying to push me out of the nest and yeah. i'm not naturally ready um, yeah. And then there were all the whole mixed mixed mission. Is that what you called it? Mixed. Um, I called it mission impossible mission because impossible. It, it's impossible to fully satisfy one's parents, you know, unmet promises and unfulfilled commitments to oneself. So, you know, children are not there to be our narcissistic ambassadors or emissaries into the world. They're there to live their own lives. Mm -hmm. And when children feel burdened or freighted by that expectation, I can go to college, but I have to follow a path that was laid out for me by someone else. They often sabotage themselves and mm -hmm. find ways to return home until they're free to create their own pathway. Yeah, the story that you had in the book was of a girl that you said she was going to law school and her mother had this, like, you know, didn't necessarily go to law school, was a paralegal, always wanted to go to law school. Her dad, on the other hand, was a lawyer and was like forced to be a lawyer and wish he hadn't been a lawyer. So right. she had these two divergent right. messages from mother and father. And I thought, oh, my yes. God, that would be very hard. So this is the kind well, of, yeah. Yeah, that's the loyalty mind right yeah. there. Yeah. could not sort out or integrate her loyalty to her mother, loyalty to her father, and most significantly, her loyalty to herself. In fact, she didn't have sufficient loyalty to herself to figure out what she wanted to do. She was so busy trying to fulfill the expectations of each of her parents, which were contrary to each other. Yeah. And then you have um, creating a narrative. I like that idea, too, which it feels like that's what my son is doing now. Like he's joining a frat. We're like, a frat? You know, but it's, but it's I, and I, and I just... You know, we're like, okay, a frat. I mean, this is what you want to do. You know, go for it. So, what's That's happening right. with what? What? What kind of narrative? What? What are they trying to do from with respect to um, identifying themselves? Well, 
all children want their parents to be happy with them. That's also built into us. And that's why many kids during early childhood, middle childhood, even early adolescence will often, although not always, kind of follow through on the things that their parents expect them to do or want them to do or that make their parents proud of them. But at a certain point, you have to disinvest and unplug from what everyone else thinks you should be doing in order to figure out what you're going to plug into and what you're going to invest in. Sometimes you wind up reinvesting or replugging into the very things that you were doing all along. Often you don't. Mm -hmm. And so creating the narrative is telling the story of your life on your terms with you as the author, not with your parents as the author or the co-author. And, you know, we, we never feel completely successful. We never feel completely autonomous uh, unless we're living our own life. Mm. To, you know, to be successful living someone else's life is not very appealing to most young adults. They'd rather fail at living their life than be successful living someone else's life. Yeah. So the narrative has to be one's own creation, one's own pilgrimage or journey towards self-realization, towards fulfillment, towards meaning, towards purpose. And that, again, is a natural process that as parents, particularly at this stage, we have to kind of marginalize and peripheralize ourselves from and not get in the way of. Well, you know what's funny? Even though I was horrified at age 28, it was at age 28 when I realized that uh, my, my parents, who were both immigrants, uh, and the formula for immigrants was be an engineer, do something for a Chinese immigrant, was be an engineer, do something technical, do some safe job in the background, don't be in the foreground. And so mm -hmm. I was in finance, and I hated absolutely every single day but in that job. But this was a job that they wanted me to do. So I did that job until I was 28. And I thought, you know, I've, I really tried, but I can't, this is making me miserable. The last time I was happy was when I was in college doing marketing. So I'm just going to have to go to business school and get out of whatever this is. And it was at age 28 that I finally yeah, was be able to create my own narrative. So even though yeah. I scoffed at 28, I guess <laughs> I was 28. <laughs> When I finally created my own narrative. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good real, nice piece of self-awareness. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking of. I guess I was also 28. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So some of the other things in here. Um, so um, the declaration of independence, creating a new narrative. Um, uh, there's also um, forging responsibility to your own identity. Um, I think this is this is the thing we've talked about when navigating loyalty to your family. Um, I can't find uh, oh forging connection between freedom and responsibility. That one, tell me, because <laughs> I have a whole bunch of questions related to this one. Well, again, like I said earlier, our culture doesn't do a particularly good job of speaking the language of grief. I don't think we do a good job of speaking the language of responsibility either. Um, in our culture, we're taught that as you become older, you're free of responsibility. You don't have to be so responsible when the reality is that being free means that you can handle responsibilities with grace and maturity. So, you know, all these uh, young adults are looking forward to when, okay, now I can legally drink or I can legally right. do this or do that. But, you know, true responsibility is the freedom to take on the duties and obligations of being a good citizen, a good person, uh, taking care of others, not just being taken care of. And so I think we have to change, again, the conversation, the language when it comes to responsibility and freedom, because responsibility, when taken on solidly, is in fact freeing. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really feel very free. You certainly don't have any self-respect if you can't handle responsibilities well. And that's the ultimate building block to self-assuredness is knowing that you can handle responsibility well. Self-esteem doesn't come from being told you're terrific or you're great or you're awesome. It comes from knowing that you can handle adversity, that you can stand up to a challenge, that you can tolerate defeat and diminishment, and life is filled with defeat and diminishment, and yet still maintain your integrity and your nobility as an individual. Mm. So I have um, my younger son. Is this this uh Here's the tension. So uh, there are instances where I feel he should be doing something my way. I mean, I see the ridiculousness of it, okay? But here's my problem with it. So um, I see that there's 
a certain way of doing it, which is right, which is my way. And then there is <laughs> his way of doing something. And uh, the, the, the problem at hand is like how much he talks to teachers with respect to his grades. He rather, he would prefer to have it be a black box, get it, and then be upset. I'm suggesting that he actually work with the teachers and understand what he needs to do so that it's not a black box and he yes. doesn't get upset. Okay. Right. Very rational, right. I think, my perspective. <laughs> However, I'm like, well, why don't you talk to the teachers? And he's like, you know, and I said, I would like to talk to the teachers. And he's like, no, you cannot talk to the teachers because if you talk to the teachers, then it affects me. So why do you need to get involved at all? And I said, well, because... I'm going to hear you complain about this black box and how you think it's unfair. And I think oftentimes through a conversation and developing a relationship with the teachers that you'll understand better what's happening. Cause right now it feels like a black box. And I think, you know, we're going to a private school, we're paying a lot of money. They should be forming a relationship with you. And I know that they're happy to. So you have a whole bunch of uh, presuppositions about what's happening. That's not accurate. It's like, no, I refuse to do it. And I was like, okay, I, I don't know what to do because at the same time, I know that it will make a difference. And so I said, well, I was talking to um, one of the people, the support people. And she said, well, I, I'm going to go talk to them. And I was like, okay, but if you talk to them, I have to talk to my son because I don't think that that's right. Like I'm talking to you. So then I did that. And then he got super pissed off justifiably. Like I, that was my bad. Um, but it's a, it's a tough situation because it's like a, a kid who – who is about to stick their finger in, except they're not going to die, into an electrical outlet, right? Yes. And you're like, no, don't do that, or this is how things work. But then at the same time, it's not. I don't really know what the right appropriate – and I've talked to a couple of girlfriends who are like, just tell him what to do. Just talk to the teachers behind their, you know, behind his back. I'm like, no, that just doesn't seem right either. So I don't really know what the right, this whole freedom and responsibility, this kind of brings this issue up. What, what do you think parents should do? I don't want a helicopter. I don't want a snow plow. But I also see that there are other solutions that he's not thinking of and he refuses to try. Well, there's several ways of looking at it. Tell me again how old he is. Um, he's 16. Okay, so a junior, a yeah, sophomore, junior, junior. junior. Okay. First of all, you were wise to make <clears throat> the distinction between putting your finger in a socket and screwing up an assignment and pissing and moaning about it. Because you're right, if there's an issue that's going to have irreversible or tragic consequences, there's no question that as a right. parent, you certainly with a 16 year old. But if it's not something that has tragic or irreversible repercussions and 10 years from now is unlikely to make much of a significant difference in their lives, then I think it's best to stay marginal. Although you do have the right to then say, listen, you want to do it your way and um, <laughs> refrain from getting assistance or direction. That's your call. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be interested in hearing you piss and moan about it and complain about it. You're going to have to manage that piece of it on your own as well. So you don't want to set it up as lose, lose for you. He refutes and repudiates and spurns what you offer and then wants to complain to you about how badly things are okay. going. So I did say that and he said, but don't, so then you don't want me to talk to you at all when I'm upset. And I said, no, <laughs> That's not true, but he's a, he's actually really good at speech and debate. This is the problem. Too. <laughs> yes, he, sound, he sounds highly skilled and highly sophisticated. Yes. So. He's like, so you don't want me to tell you when I'm upset? Then like the end result of this is going to be me not telling you when I'm upset. What which would you rather, me not telling you when I'm upset and withdraw these emotions or not? And I was like, I don't know. On this particular dimension – and around this particular issue, should you decide to um, refrain from following my advice, I have no choice but to respect that. But I won't be interested in your complaining about it if it doesn't go your way. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in hearing from you and your mixed feelings about any other issues that are important. But around this one, you know, I have no choice but to respect your decision to decline my good recommendation. But then I don't want to have to hear about it. Yep. Okay, fair enough. I, I get that. And I also appreciate the, the litmus test is in 10 years from now, you know, if he's going to yeah. die, yes. Then you have right. to intercede. But if he's not going to die, you know, if it's, if it's not dire or 10 years back, you're going to regret this moment. 
then let it right. pass. Like, I, I like that as just kind of a good litmus test on, like, yes or no. All right, now there's a whole bunch of other things as parents are now waiting for their children to come back to call, come back during summer vacation. And there's, yes. and what I've heard is that it's a, that's absolutely awful because they've taken freedom <laughs> and responsibility. <laughs> and you're like, what? You can, what? You're staying out to what time? What? You know, like that kind of thing. So what's a, what's a good way of, um, handling this i'm coming back from college i've been operating as, as my independent agent this whole you know this whole semester two semesters what can parents do to create a, a, a an amicable relationship when the kid comes back well again the first thing is not to oversimplify to extend that sentence hey i've been a free agent uh, these last you know two semesters these last six to eight months mm -hmm. the other half of that sentence which is usually unspoken is they're saying i was my own boss i was in charge of everything i was a free agent um the unspoken part of that sentence is and it exhausted me it terrified me there were times i wanted nothing more than to have someone else be in charge of my life and so it's often their ambivalence about returning home and fearing that they're going to get drawn by the undertow back towards dependence mm. that often creates that friction so again, people say, well, it's just because, you know, they're used to being on their own and now they don't want limits and curfews. I think it's much more complicated than that. And I think there's a part of them that still might be longing for or wishing for those limits that were in place because it was so scary. That's why often, you know, you hear about the sophomore slump in college. I think that's often because freshmen summoned every fiber of their resourcefulness to make this adjustment and to adapt to independent life. And all of a sudden it occurs to them, oh my God, this wasn't just for one year, this is my life. Mm. And that's why they slump into sophomore year because it's like they were ready for one lap, but they didn't think the finish line mm. would have to continue to be expended. So as I said, there's usually when there's those kinds of fights and frictions, you know, sometimes just a basic butting of heads or skin on skin kind of friction. But usually it has deeper roots than that. And the parents, too, have their mixed feelings. Part of them may have been and probably was relieved to some extent to have their son or daughter leave home. And part of them missed the child terribly and wants them back home. And so the question that's being sorted out is not what's the curfew or what dishes need to be done or who mows the lawn. It has to do with how do we recalibrate our relationship, knowing that in another eight to 10 weeks, we then have to recalibrate it again. And mm. that can be quite demanding and sometimes demoralizing for both generations. Right. So on the on the kids side, you're saying that they're feeling like I'm just exhausted. I'm kind of glad to be home and having you do my laundry and cooking meals and all that yes. stuff. And right. so it's kind of nice to not have to figure it out a lot on my own. I want to take a vacation from that. So you kind of like you're a free agent now. I'm expecting you to act like an adult. You know, that kind of thing um, is kind of like I'm yeah. exhausted. Please. I was hoping I'd get a break from that. Yes, they're conflicted. Yeah. I mean, most young adults have a fear about leaving home and most young adults deal with that fear by acting like they've already left home or that they're going to leave home. And, you know, that's what happens during the end of high school is a lot of kids have a difficult time then because they're terrified of leaving home. Their words are, I can't wait to get out of here and I can't wait to be on my own and college is going to be great. I'll get you guys out of my hair. But a lot of that is really fraudulent. It's just a way of covering up or compensating for their fears. So they act like they've already left when in reality it has to do with their fretfulness mm. about having to leave. Mm. And so the same dynamic then gets reignited when they come home for winter break mm. or for summer break. Uh, all of that gets restarted and parents and young adult children aren't always conscious of that. Right. So it's like a push me, pull me on both parts. Like, I want you to be free, but I missed you. And it's like, I yes. want to be with you. I don't want to be. I'm free. So yeah. it's kind of, so you're really, it's not as if there's a straight answer and formula necessarily so much as kind of a, a dance and understanding where your kid's yeah. at and kind of adjusting based on what the, it's like having a conversation. <laughs> Is that right? When they come home, like, yes. let's talk about it. And, and that's, yeah. you use the right word. It's understanding. And the parents sometimes have to take the lead in understanding how highly ambivalent 
both the returning student and the parents are about this re-engagement when both of them have probably worked really, really hard to create some sort of healthy disentanglement from each mm, other. That's yeah. why those breaks and vacations don't always feel like breaks and vacations. Uh, okay. Cause there's this dance happening between I do and I don't, I do and I want to like, get, 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 and both parties are playing mm-hmm. with this dance and they're not even conscious of it. Yeah, Fast exactly. Enough. Okay, so then uh, I had a whole group of women in my book club, and they were asking things like, okay, so finding jobs, you know, how finding jobs, uh, budgets, you know, how much how much is too much? You know, I don't want my kid to, like, be, you know, suffering. If, if we can afford it um, and we have connections, how much should we help them in finding their next job? How much should we help them in paying for college? Like, it's one thing if you don't have the money, it's like, I don't have the money. You have to pay these things because otherwise you can't go to college. But if you can afford to pay these things, you have the connections. What's the appropriate balance so that your kid learns the appropriate life skills um, to budget and to find a job, which are important life skills to have before you graduate from college. But at the same time, you're not stingy. Uh, I lost the last part of what you said. Uh, and at the same time, you're not stingy, right? You know, I have these ah. resources. I'm I'm holding back because I want you to prove yourself, you know, that kind of stuff. How do you balance this? You have the resources, but at the same time, you don't want to just give your kid the resources because then they don't learn appropriate life skills. Yeah, well, again, the, the issue there is balance as well. Um, <clears throat> if one has the resources to invest in one's child's education, I think that's an appropriate investment. And I don't think many of us would question that, that you might ask your son or daughter to cover daily expenses or recreational expenses. That's legitimate because that helps them develop that sense of duty, obligation, budgeting. And you don't want to subsidize or underwrite a child to the extent that they don't feel any urgency or any motivation to forge ahead with their lives and take on the responsibility of the job. When it comes to when education is done and has been concluded and hopefully paid for, then I think parents have to stay out of the way. And despite whatever connections they have, um, every time they do that, they're inadvertently corroding the possibility of the young adult developing self-respect and a Mm. sense of self-assuredness. Right, right. Because it's like, oh, I just got this job because my parents helped me find this job. So I don't know if I could have really done it on my own. Right. It, it undercuts their sense of competence or mastery. Mm. And that's a different region of life, a different domain of life than my parents were smart enough or savvy enough or conscientious enough to have basically been able to fund or subsidize a college education, right. which, you know, as we know, education is an investment and that's, right. a, that's a wise investment. Right. And the last thing that it seems like a lot of uh, friends of mine who have kids that have launched is how often do we communicate? And we call our son once a week. And that's it. But I have friends who are texting their kids every day, three or four times a day. And I told my husband, he's like, I want to text them. I'm like, no, you cannot text them. Like, just leave them alone. (laughs) So what is, do you have any, I don't know if there are any rules or thumbs or what are the things that you should consider when coming up with how often you communicate with your kids when they're, you know, supposedly independent? Well, the main thing to consider is, what do they want? And that's, like I said, a conversation that often doesn't occur. Parent and child cobble together some sort of arrangement without it being clear that this is in both of their best interests or their works for the son or the daughter. So, you know, if, if, if the consenting adults, in this case, the parent and the young adult, you know, want to text throughout the day or text during the day or stay in touch by phone frequently and it works for both of them you know i think that that's fine but often that conversation or that agreement is not held and one of them feels a little bit hostage to the other Mm. the son or the daughter feels like um you know i have to respond because after all they're paying the tuition or they feel like why am i being bugged or intruded on to that extent or sometimes parents feel this obligation you know my friends are texting their kids every day i guess i should do that as well in general less is more at this stage of development less communication less (laughs) and why is less more 
because it gives them room to grow. We, we, our job as parents is to contract and condense ourselves at this stage of development. And it's painful to do that. Mm -hmm. That goes back to that grieving piece, that acknowledgement that, you know, we're being nudged farther and farther along toward the edge of the bowl. And we know what's on the other side of the bowl. <laughs> and so we find ways to avoid that by inserting ourselves into our children's lives and maintaining our relevance and our uh, necessity. But that's not always developmentally advantageous. Yeah. Okay. So um, now these are questions that relate to you and your children. Because, you know, I, I found like I can coach people about their lives. No. Yes. When, and then, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's always then, easier. Yeah, so how about yourself? You have a you have um children yourself. Now you have grandchildren. Like what was that process? Yeah. What were the hardest things for you even knowing all the information <clears throat> that you have from your own work experience? What was the hardest yes. thing for you? Well, just because psychologists are aware of these dynamics, it doesn't mean they're immune to them or <laughs> okay. inoculated yeah. against them. So, uh, yeah, without without question, when we launched our youngest child and she left home, you know, it, it stirred tremendous grief and tremendous longing. And it forces you to come to terms with, at some basic level, mortality. Mm -hmm. And I will add that grandparenthood, in addition to being a tremendous joy and, and a great source of satisfaction, it does the same thing. Our granddaughters love my wife and I, and they enjoy being with us, but we're not central to their lives. Their parents are, and it's unmistakable that that's happening. And that's as it should be, but it's a reminder that, you know, our children are there to replace us. That That's why they're here. They're not here to respect us. They're not here to make us proud. They're, they're here to take over. That's how it works. And so, the reminders of that when children leave home, when we become grandparents, uh, they're bittersweet. Um, I wouldn't give up my grandchildren by any means, but the reminders of mortality and time and its foreshortened finitude, that's hard to ignore at the okay, same so time. Okay, so you see your grandchild and you're like, got time to go. I mean, like, <laughs> like what is that? Is that what reminds you of mortality when you see your grandchild? You're like, wow, I'm being like the next generation has occurred. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, sure. Wow. I'm being pushed closer and closer to the edge of the bench, and the bench is only so big, <laughs> and I'm well, going to fall off the bench. Well, it's funny because you mentioned in this book, and I, and as when my child was leaving, I was, I was reading through the various stages of development, and they stop at age fifty. I think like you're you're dead to the world after that point. And one of the things that you you pointed out in your book is that there are a whole bunch of developmental stages that happen for us after the kids leave. What and because I'm yes. not at that stage yet, I'm at the just the beginning. Tell me what what are those phases so I have a kind of a preview of what to expect. Well, you just as the young adult is writing the new narrative and creating and authoring these new chapters in his or her life, we as the parents get to do that as well. And so while there's tremendous sorrow and tremendous longing associated with a child leaving home and no longer feeling so relevant or so necessary, it does also liberate you and create new possibilities for growth, for development, interests that could not have been possibly pursued uh, or explored when we're in the throes and the trenches of child rearing get to be explored. Um, if you're still in a working marriage, you know, you get to focus on yourselves without the the fulcrum of child rearing that's sitting right. in the middle of your right. lives. Right. So there's there's tremendous imagined and unimagined possibilities that await us. And I'm glad that you brought that up. It's not like, you know, once we launch our children, there's nothing left for us to do but die. But <laughs> on the other hand, that launching and those stages are reminders that life is finite and it does come to its end. Well, I, I've noticed with a lot of my girlfriends, it does seem like, like, okay, I'm done. I'm out, you know, peace out, I'm, I'm out, you know, like I'm done with everything. So I, yeah. I don't know if that, is that a, a stage where you go through this kind of um, water-like wandering of not knowing exactly who you are because you've lost a, a yes. good portion of your identity. And so there's like yes. this period of like finding yourself all over again. And, and then you mentioned yeah. this in the book, like you have couples who like they find that they like tennis again or they find themselves, right. their passions again. Is that... 
right. the stage that is that the next stage. I like you, you lose yourself. Then you find some aspect of yourself. And then what happens? <laughs> like, what happens after that? You get liberated. <laughs> Where are you now in this phase? Well, then you try, you know, you're, you're, you're going back to that phrase, get lost again, to some extent, that's good advice. We need to get lost and experience that loss so that we can refine and rediscover or find and discover new pathways, new panoramas, new horizons to pursue. And then hopefully we enrich our lives with those new possibilities and these new exploits and explorations, and it fills our life in a different way. Mm -hmm. But Time only goes in one direction and you can't turn back the clock. And a lot of families try to do that. They try to stay frozen in a developmental stage. And that's not how growth and evolution work. Wait, what is frozen in developmental stage? It's the stuff that we talked about earlier, like they're still yeah. mourning and they don't properly yeah. grieve. So they get frozen in that stage. Yeah. They're, they're afraid to move on. They're afraid to let go in preparation for new possibilities. You know, new doors don't open until you close old doors. And sometimes we're afraid to close the old door. Interesting. Right. So grieving is so important because if you don't grieve, then you can't close the new door and then you cannot be liberated because you can't open yeah. the new one. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Right. I, that was, that's actually one of the, and I know that you said you started off by saying that is the one of the most important. I had no idea how important it was until this conversation. No, seriously. Don't, I believe it. Yeah. And, Most and, of us don't. That, that's why I focused on it so intently. Yeah. Love it. Um, thank you so much. We've been talking to Dr. Brad Sachs about his book, Emptying the Nest. And, and in his book, he covers, we've just done like a whole overview of your entire book from, you know, what happens to your children developmentally, um, what we didn't cover and what we did though through demonstration is um, getting beyond whatever, which uh, look at all the parts that I labeled and underlined. <laughs> Just try to come up with language on, you know, here's what most parents say. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I say. What should I be saying instead? <laughs> it, this section was super helpful. So there's, um, we talked about um, what's happening to your kids developmentally, what's happening to you in this book, uh, talking, figuring out how to have productive conversations with your kids, um, preparing um, yourself for separation, um, your marriage and what that looks like after marriage, um, after your kids leave, and then um, the kind of things that parents go through, the process, what we just kind of touched upon. So this book has, it's like literally an A to Z um, kind of reference, and I really enjoy it. Thank you so much for being here and pleasure. writing this book. Yeah, thank you. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.